Hey, I want to thank it. Thank everybody for joining us. Um, and, and so kind of we've, this has been one of those things that we get lots and lots of questions on. People are always like, I don't understand all the different graphs. How do we understand what's going on? How do I look at, how do, how do I make sense of all of this? So we're really fortunate. Um, so I'm going to kind of moderate this thing tonight and kind of give some perspective, but we're really fortunate because we got Kim Roland Dollins, who's with Riders Run Guide, Serv Guide Service. And Cody with Finn and Fe Cody Griffin with Finn and Feather Fly Fishing. These guys are out on the river every day, so they they have a lot of real world experience. Uh, and, and the truth is, is this is something they do every night. They get up, you know, they got a trip the next day. They're looking at all those graphs and gauges and trying to figure out, like, you know, how do I put together an enjoyable day for my client? How do I know what the water is going to be doing and where, you know, where's the best place to put in and at what time, you know. What are the conditions going to be and are the conditions going to be safe for my clients? And so I'm really, we're really fortunate to have them here uh, and we'll take tons and, you know, we're hoping to get, you know, questions. And so um, a couple of things I'll just ask up front is if you have questions, um, just pop them in that chat box. Um, we'll, we'll try to watch for it. Um, and, but, you know, by all means, kind of pipe up. This is kind of everybody's time to, to kind of work their way through it. Um, the other thing is all of this PowerPoint, uh, thanks to Ron, is up on Facebook right now. So if you see something you like, you want to go back and pull that slide, you can do it uh, from Facebook. So thanks to Ron for that. So what we're going to do tonight is just really kind of at a high level. We're going to go, what's the difference between the rivers? Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about all each of the Arkansas tailwaters and not a lot um, about the others, because we're really going to focus on the Little Red, but I think there's some we want to take a minute and kind of talk about some distinctions. We're going to talk about the resources that are available. Like, where do I go to get the information that helps me figure it out? And how do we take all these various inputs to figure out what's happening and predict what's coming? And then knowing all that, how do we plan a fun day? Um, Ed, were you able to join us? I know he was going to try to dial in. If he's not, I'll walk through it. Right, so, so I'm trying to unmute. Hey, there we go. Hey, Ed. We're Thanks. fortunate. We're fortunate. We've got Ed drilling with us. Ed, can you see the slide or are you on your phone? I'm on my phone. Okay. Well, let me tell you what's on the slide. I'll tell everybody what's on the slide and then I'm going to let you fill in the blanks. Is that fair? And, sure. And we're, we're super happy to have Ed. AFF and the Little Red River Foundation have a great working relationship. Um, and we're, we're pleased to have Ed is also a member of AFF. And so Ed reached out um, and the Corps of Engineers has started a transformer refurbishment on January the 4th and something called a manual operated disconnect. And I don't really know exactly what that means, but it sounds to me like they just disconnected everything. And the bottom line is this is going to take about six weeks. Um, and so there's no generation from the main units. Uh, so either one of the generators, it's only coming through the house. Um, and that's not gonna change unless water levels get above the conservation pool and the gates will be used for releases. And there's a slide on here that Ed sent me today. Um, and I'll let Ed fill in the blanks from there. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, Tillman. I, I, and no, by no means am I any expert on any of this stuff, but what kind of prompted me about this discussion was um, a few weeks ago when I was uh, on the river and I kept hearing from some of my neighbors that are you hearing that they're going to stop generation for a few weeks and replace the, the generators, the turbines in the dam. And I had not heard that. And I don't think the, the Game and Fish Commission had heard that either. Many, some of you may have, but Anyway, I reached out to the contact I've got at the Corps of Engineers just to inquire, uh, and he put me in touch with the project manager over this uh, this project, and he did confirm that just what Tim was saying on the slide there, that they're going to be down for approximately six weeks, about three weeks to repair or replace each, each uh, generator. And in the meantime, what they're going to rely on it's what they call the house unit or the auxiliary unit, which actually powers the office there at the dam. It doesn't generate power for the grid, but it just powers their office there. 
I thought it was actually more than this, but they told me that it generates about 20 CFS, which is not very much at all. Um, and then when they get above pool or where they're, I guess, concerned that they are going to be above approaching pool, they're just going to release water over the top, which is what I took a picture of today there, which, you know, it, interestingly, as much as we're wanting to talk about being able to predict and know and, you know, be aware of what's going on with these releases, uh, you know, today is a good example. I mean, they released water over the top, you know, at the top of the dam there, and uh, there wasn't anything on the app. There wasn't anything I could tell on the numbers that I was trying to call to confirm. Um, but there was a post on their Facebook site that said, you know, we're releasing water today. Uh, it's going to be about 3,200 CFS. Um, I don't know. I, I left, you know, about one o'clock and I'm not sure if it, Kim may know, you know, when, if they stopped it or not. But, um, but anyway, that, that's, you know, what they're going to, that's going to be their pattern, I guess, until they get through with these uh, replacements and repairs for the dam. So. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, that's exactly, I mean, I think all of us have been watching it for, I don't know, about two weeks now where there was nothing. And then today there was something. Um, and the water looked really good today. So we'll, so uh, we're going to kind of try one, to One thing, Tip. Yeah. I was just going to say one other thing I might qu just very quickly report on to this group that may be of interest. You know, we've been looking for projects uh, to work with different different organizations uh, on the Little Red River. And um, we finally got a pretty significant contribution um, last year to the foundation. And so we're in the process of partnering with uh, the Game and Fish Commission to look for ways to improve wading access into the river. Um, so I met one of the, Tim Burnley, who's one of the staff members for the uh, Game and Fish Commission up there a couple of weeks ago, and we went to several different sites on the river and looked at ways that, that we could partner with them with either rock or steps or a different structure to try to improve the wading access into several different places on the river. So they're making their list and kind of prioritizing it. But I'm hoping, you know, in the next um, few months that we'll, we can make some progress on that. And uh, we'll certainly keep this organization uh, posted and aware of what, what's going on with that as well. Thanks, Ed. No, we appreciate that. I mean, Little Red River Foundation doing great stuff. I mean, I know the cutthroat was last year's project, or I guess it's really been almost two years now. Um, but we do appreciate the work of the Little Red River Foundation, and, you know, we encourage folks to give them a look. Uh, if you're not a member of the Little Red River Foundation and you, and you fish the Little Red, you really ought to think about it. All right. Well, we'll we're going to kind of walk, we're going to transition to the presentation. Um, so where do you find data? Um, and you find data, um, <coughs> you can call those phone numbers. Um, you can call the Little Red, you can call the White, you can call, you can call the 501 or the 870 number, and those are going to tell you what's going on on the dam. And we're going to talk about it in a minute, but you have to be careful when you call that number because they report in whole units. Um, and so if they're generating a half a unit, or they're only going to tee it up to one unit. They're going to do whole units. And so sometimes that's a little misleading, uh, but those numbers exist. You can go to the websites. Uh, there is a uh, the Southwest Power Authority. I'll be honest with you, it, I have trouble accessing it um, perennially um, for whatever reason. Um, and then SWEPCO maintains Little Missouri. So Southwest Power Authority is going to have the Little Red, the White, and the North Fork, and Swepco is going to have the Little Missouri, and that's our four tailwaters, really. Uh, and we're going to spend our time tonight on the app because as we sat down with Kim and Cody and Brian and I talking about this presentation last week, uh, we were all of the mind that the app is really sort of your best bet. That's really, if you can get to the app, that's your best bet. And so we're actually going to, you'll see screenshots from the app tonight that will show you exactly what you'll be looking at. In fact, we may go live to the app for some of it just based on the conditions changing today. It's kind of funny because when we started putting this presentation together, they were working on the river. So everything was zeros. 
And so it really wasn't all that helpful to, to give you graphs that showed nothing ever changing. And then the day we do the presentation, a couple hours before it, they change everything around. That's that's the way it goes. And if you tell me if you go back to that last slide real quick, if if you don't have this app downloaded, uh, it'd probably be a good thing during the presentation. Just go ahead and download this app right down here at the bottom of the screen. That way you can actually walk through it on your phones while we're talking about it. Very good. Yep. Very good. Thanks, Cody. So this is the little red. Um, and then to kind of just give you some, um, we're going to put up all four of the tailwaters and we're going to kind of show you some differences. We're not going to spend a ton of time on the other rivers, but I think there's some important differences that if you're thinking about Arkansas tailwaters, it's useful to understand some things apply and some things don't. Um, and so you kind of see these mileage charts and we can, we can come back to this slide later if we need to, but if you start up at the top by Greer's Ferry up in that upper left-hand corner, and then you start going all the way down to Pangburn Bridge, you're talking about 24 miles of water. Ramsey Access is really kind of considered the end of the tailwater, or at least for trout, although you can catch trout below that. Um, but you're now talking at about 29 miles, so about 30 miles of water, basically, as a frame of reference. Um, and we'll talk about some of these places. If I need to bounce back, just, just tell me and we'll, we'll bounce back there. But this compares to, we're going to show the White River, um, Bull Shoals. So if you look at this, Bull Shoals is almost half again as long, but it's misleading because it's a wide river. And so where the Little Red is a more channelized river that runs deeper, the White River is a wide river that runs more shallow and it has 12 units. No, Cody, I got that back. Eight units. Eight. Eight units, sorry. I knew that didn't sound right. Um, so, but on the, just to kind of give you a sense of it, when you see wildcat shoals there, when they start turning on at three or four units, which is a good level, um, then you're gonna have about three hours and then rim shoals, which is another great walk-in access. And if you hadn't been down there, Game and Fish has put a walk-in access that runs for about a mile down the river now, which is fantastic. Um, it's about six hours down there. So just kind of understand that uh, if you understand the little red, you don't necessarily understand uh, how the generation works on the white because it's, it's just, there's more units, it's a different kind of river, it's a longer river. So just understand that. Um, and in waiting on there, you can wait a few places up to about two units and then it gets pretty tough. The Norfolk is a different kind of river, right? Um, if it starts generating, it's super short. The whole river is five miles long and it's, it's got two units, but once they turn it on, it doesn't take very long at all, um, it, it's gonna be down there. So your waiting is pretty much done. So just understand that the, the White and the North Fork are very different than what we're gonna talk about tonight. And then Lake Greeson, I had somebody ask me about this because it's on a completely different system and that's what their generation schedule looks like. It's just an Excel spreadsheet on the Swepco site. Uh, although I will say they follow it pretty regularly. Um, so you can pretty much um, generally expect whatever's on that schedule, um, Swepco kind of sticks to. But again, it's a real short river. There's no boats on this river, by the way, because there's weirs um, along the river. But again, only about six miles of water. So once they start generating, it comes up quick um, and the waiting is over. So this is the app Cody was talking about. This is the US Army Corps of Engineer Little Rock app. Um, he's right, you should doubt, if you don't have it, you should. Um, and hopefully by the end of the night, you'll not only realize that you should have it if you don't already, uh, but you'll kind of know where we go. And so I'll tell you, we kind of talked last week um, and when we kind of went over it, we sort of settled in on, uh, there were four parts of the app that we think we use about 90% of the time or more. Um, and quite honestly, I don't think I really use any of the other parts of the app. Uh, but these are the four we go through, and we're going to we're going to drive we're going to dive into each one of these. Any questions so far? I'm sorry, I, I don't know if I can see the chat while I'm doing this. I don't. Nothing's popped up in the chat yet. Okay, so you you'll hit me if it does. 
So we're going to start with releases. So we're looking at a bunch of different data here. I um, mean, and Cody and Kim, y'all can jump in and correct me or say you want to talk about this. But the um, go back real quick, if you would. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So just to show people this home screen and what they're going to see when they go into the app. Uh, so when he clicks on releases up there in that top left hand corner, that's going to pop up the chart for what I call real time data, which is live data and it shows you exactly what's going on on the river right now. So like I had a lot of calls this morning of people getting uh, to the river this morning to go wade fishing and they show up and they were running water, but they had, hadn't scheduled any water. And it's like Ed had said earlier, uh, well, they hadn't scheduled any water, but they're releasing water from the floodgates. And that water that comes from the floodgates is not included in that generation schedule. But if they would have went to the releases right here and saw the live data, they would have been able to uh, see exactly what was going on in the river um, at that time. You can go ahead and go back to it now. Okay. So I'm gonna, so in that app, I'm gonna kind of walk you through some different pieces that we think we look at. Um, the first one is, is you're just gonna start looking at the power pool and understanding that. So the top of the flood pool is 487 feet. When it gives above that, they're, they're worried about flooding. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a second. The current power pool relates to the top of the power pool. And so that's 462.04 most of the year. Um, May to June, it goes up a little bit. Um, April, May goes up a little bit. Um, and then you have the bottom of the power pool. But understanding where the power pool is, and you're reading that in where it says elevation in feet right here. I don't know if y'all can see my cursor moving, but down there where elevation is circled, and that's where that number's coming from. So that's one of your first predictors. When that number's getting way up in the power pool, they're wanting to move some water um, to keep it in the current power pool, right? If it gets way above that, then they got to open up those gates. Uh, but understanding that is part of what drives uh, that decision process. And we're going to show you a little bit later in this presentation, the White River at Georgetown. And there's kind of a hashed line there. Um, and the reason to understand that is, is when the White River at Georgetown is in flood status, they don't want to generate on the Little Red. They don't want to add more water to that flood stage because it's not part of their flood control plans. And so the White River at Georgetown, which is downstream, that's an important number to understand. So when we're in uh, the region has a lot of water pumping through it, you know, you know, the Mississippi's flooding, you know, the White is flooding, that whole White River Basin's flooding. Start watching that number for flood stage at Georgetown because that number tells you whether or not uh, Greer's Ferry can, is going to do releases. Um, and they're not really going to try to pump a lot of water out of there unless they're really starting to push up at the top of the flood pool. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So this is- so We're full... currently, and we're currently about uh, four tenths of a foot over power pool right now. So that might be why we be, are seeing some of the, uh, the floodgates um, or as well as just giving a good push of water to clean that river up. But we are above power pool right now from the last couple of rains. All right. So when we're talking about dead low, you'll hear people use the term dead low, which really means we're not generating any water. And so that means that dead low or no generation is generally described as being at 265.5 feet at the tailwater. So that means they're not generating at all. And if you see you know, kind of that fourth column where it says tailwater, that's where you read that. That number is a tattletale. tale. Um, if you're watching that number and if you look there and it said total release is 20, um, but that number was 271, you know, 272, you know there's some water coming through there that's not being accounted for. There's something wrong in the data. Um, but if you watch those things, 
that tailwater number tells you a lot. Um, and as they generate, so each unit is going to add about four and a half feet to that. And so you can kind of figure on um, in 3,500 CFS. So when we were talking today about they open the spillways to 3,200, they're running just under one unit right now. Um, they're just running it through the spillway releases. Uh, they're not running it through um, that total, or they're not running it through the turbines. Uh, they're not generating. Um, and so that gets at that point, which not all the water is coming through the generator. Some of it's coming through the uh, the house turbine uh, that Ed was describing earlier, which is not very much. That's that constant 20. Uh, and the, uh, but each one of those is gonna add about four and a half feet. So that 260, 276, when you see it at 276, you know that they're pushing. Sorry, I have a teenage daughter wear me out. Um, you know that they're going to put that. That's what that reflects. All right. Tailwater is confusing. And, and you say tailwater is confusing, or uh, am I confusing it, or just uh, I want to make sure I'm answering your question. So Annette was saying, yeah, the tailwater is confusing. Uh, so like he Tillman had talked about earlier. 265 is dead low or no generation. So at the lowest, that number should be 265. And since they're putting out water from the floodgates, uh, that water comes up however how much. And Ron says right it comes now up it's, to it's about 10 feet higher right now with what's so, coming out today. Right. So. <laughs> That's where I would look, and this actually, can, you know, sometimes the app isn't uh, working right. And this actually happened to me and Tillman one day. We went wade fishing, and the app just was blanks. And it wasn't showing anything at all, just, just straight lines, no zeros or nothing. And the generation schedule had showed that it was supposed to run nothing. And they ended up coming up on us. And if we would have looked at that tailwater, the tailwater was actually showing that the water was coming up. Um, but we didn't see that at the time. So like I said, it can happen to anybody. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a definitely a, a data point you want to look at because even though it might be showing zeros or might be blank, you can still look at the tailwater. And if that number's up at two, 270s instead of that 260, whatever, uh, that can be an indicator that they're running water. Y'all see it? I brought up my iPhone live. That's what it's doing right now. Right. And so just to kind of give you a sense of there's that 3200 and it's marking it as coming over the spillway. So nothing really coming out of the turbines. They're not generating at all. That's all goose eggs over there in that generation. You might show the difference. Someone had asked about the tailwater over in the column, um, the yep. tailwater column. If you can see that uh, dead low was the um, 265 and a half. Right. And then if you'll if you'll look at tailwater right now today and how much and that will show you how much has come, which will be indicative of the of the uh, spillway releases as well. But you can see that dead, you know, it's almost what is that uh, not quite 10 feet. Yeah, you know, about eight feet right now, I think. It's gone Which up. Is, yeah, it's still eight feet. At less than one unit, about about one unit of water. Yeah, yeah. So it's come up. There's a good amount of water moving. And I think they did it mainly to embarrass me today uh, since we had this presentation tonight. And so I think this is really the core getting at me one more one more time. I'll take it. Yeah, I like <laughs> it. Although, although I think um it was a little bit tough fishing at the dam today. Got to figure out. Let's see. Share that again. All right, is the slideshow coming back up? Yes. All right, good. So let's talk. I'll let you guys talk because I think you guys are far more uh, competent at this. But kind of when you're watching, and these are all approximate, and I think. Uh, you know, I've, 
So I think anytime you're going out, you have to ask yourself three questions. What is the river doing right now? What is the river going to be doing during the period of time I think I'm going to be on the river? And what's been going on on the river um, in the previous 24 to 48 hours? And I think those three things are the things that help you really understand what's happening on the river. And one of the questions we always get is, if I'm going to wade, how long do I have? And so we kind of, I think these are kind of good estimates of approximately how long it takes water to get down there. But um, I'm going to let these guys talk because I think they can, um, I think they can offer a lot of insight into kind of some variables that change this. I think uh, one of the important things uh, to, to mention as we get into this is that uh, like Tim said, these are approximate numbers, but these are affected by how much water is currently in the river. And so say it says an hour to Cal Shoals. If we had a, a generation the day before, so there's some water still left in the river and they turn on that unit again the next day, it's not going to take near as long to get to Cal Shoals that following day because there's already a little bit of water in the river still. So uh, just be mindful of that. So if you know they haven't ran water in three or four days and they run water, it's gonna run a little slower. If, it's, if they've been running quite a bit of water and then they turn it on, it's gonna be a little bit faster. Uh, just be mindful of that. And then uh, as well, these are just approximations. So like say Winkley Shoals today, three to four hours, well, Today we got floodgates and that water is gonna act a little bit different than the generation, uh, the water that we get from the generator units. So um, just be mindful of that. Uh, but this is a really good uh, graphic here. You can see uh, the miles of the river and you can see how fast to the left it shows Cal Shoals, one to one and a half hours. Winkley Shoals, three to four hours. And so these are good things to keep in mind and uh, when you're picking those spots, know, you know, maybe you're going in the morning and they turned on at eight o'clock and you got five hours to fish. Okay. So you need to be somewhere where you can stay away from that, gener you know, that generated water, uh, but still have weightable water. And so you'd have to move down river far enough to where you could fish long enough uh, to get that. So there you'd be closer down to Painburn so you could get the allotted time you need to fish. Kim, do you have any, anything to add to that? Well, no, that's pretty accurate. That covers it depending on how much water is already in there and, and uh, how long it's going to take once they turn on the generation to get there. Um, some folks like to fish that little bubble uh, before the rise, which can be good for a little while. Um, I, I like to fish the falling water more so, and so I like for it to come on down. So I try to, uh, I try to get out before the water hits me. So I usually calculate when they turn it on, get my four to five hours in. Um, that's dependent upon where I put in. So like you said, usually Lobo is a pretty safe wide area for a lot of boats to go in there and it's going to take about four to six hours to get there. So you can plan a good trip depending on how much is in there, like you said before. Um, they'll, they'll turn it off for six hours and turn it right back on again too. So we've seen that. Um, it doesn't fall down as fast. As it, as it rises, so. Yeah, we didn't kind of touch on that very long, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's gonna, it comes up very quickly, but yeah. after it comes out, you know, and levels out and they turn it off, it's gonna take it a long time to fall out, you know, probably the next day. And so um, we won't even get that dead low water unless they don't run for two or three days because mm -hmm. even after they run the previous day, we still got, you know, a little bit of water in the river uh, that will fall out slowly over a couple of days. Uh, but as far as, like, if you're wanting to fish it, um, say Mossy Shoals and they ran that day, um, you're going to have to wait till the next day because it's going gonna, it's gonna to take you that full day and night to, 
really fall out and uh, give you uh, the ability to wait in there. And so just okay. keep that in mind. But like at the dam, it only it takes it an hour right. to, to fall out. So, you know, the further you get down river, the, the longer it takes for that, that fallout to happen. Cody, can I ask a question there? Sure. Uh, what I hear you saying, and, and I guess I want to just clarify, it seems like the further down river you go, if they're on that a schedule where they've been generating, you know, eight hours and off and then eight the next day and then, you know, eight hours every day, it seems the further down the river you go, the less of a weightable window you get because that whole gap gets very diffused. Is that, that's kind of been my experience. Is that consistent? Uh, it really just depends on what time they run that water. But typically what they like to do is run that water in the afternoons. And so what we'll have is say like they do a 12 on 12 off and they do 12, 12 hours starting at 12, do 12 to 12. It'll be high down there in the, in the mornings and uh, below in the upper river. And so you kind of got your choice between, you know, high water that's falling uh, down river or you have, you know, quite a bit lower river in the upper river. I don't know if that answered your question, but. You can get behind uh, the rise. But it does take longer the further you get down river for that water to fall out because like you said, it kind of disperses and it's, it kind of evens out as it goes down river. So the further, you go down, the longer it takes to fall out. Did that answer your question, Bob? Yeah. How much of a difference does it make if they're generating one or two generators in the, the time it takes to get, does, it, does that make a difference? Yeah, it makes it a huge makes, difference. <laughs> yeah, it makes quite a lot different. I'll let you take Kim. You know, well, I mean, like you said, one unit will, will be a lot slower. It could take, if they flip the switch and say one unit on at, at uh, eight in the morning, then, you know, it's probably gone. I'm going to guesstimate about five to six hours for it to hit Lobo. Um, two units, it's going to hit there in about four hours. Um, if they flip that switch at eight and, and on it, it can be on there. I've seen it sooner than that, depending upon how much water is there. And then someone in the chat asked about, um, how much does rain factor in and that, you know, that really depends on where you're at in the river and, uh, and how much rain we got. And so I'm going to kind of talk about it on the map here. So you kind of see, if you can see, we got Crooked or you got Crooked Creek up there, or Collins Creek, sorry, Collins, Collins Creek. Uh, and then we got uh, Sulphur Creek, Creek. And then we got Big Creek down there. And so yes. depending Where's on it? how much runoff we get, so like Collins Creek doesn't have much, you know, runoff. It doesn't run off for very, very long. It, it definitely fills up and it'll run some mud in the river but like not comparatively to like Big Creek and Sulphur Creek. Sulphur and so, so for example, if we got a lot of rain in the river, it might be quite a bit lower from Swinging Bridge up because from Swinging Bridge down, you have Sulphur Creek pumping water into the river, which will be muddy. So not only will it have more water in the river, but probably muddier water. And then as you get down away from Sulphur Creek, it'll start clearing up a little bit. And then as you get down again, you get a couple more creeks. And once you get near those creeks, it starts muddying up again. Yeah. You get a little a more water. But, but if you're below Sulphur and Big Creek, you know, that's good. You're going to have a lot more water down there than you definitely would above River. So and once it starts, how, yeah, I'm sorry, Cody, go ahead. I was like thinking about how big the creeks are as well. So like Big Creek has a lot of uh, different areas that run off into that uh, creek. And so, you know, you get a lot of water out of that. Sulphur Creek pumps up out a lot of water. And so just, just those are a couple of different factors you can think of. What were you going to say, Kim? Well, I, you've said it. Um, you can always kind of move upriver a little bit. Um, when that mud starts moving in, you may have 
a few hours of opportunity to fish before it really cloud, um, clouds and muddy, muddies up a lot. Because like Cody said, more of the creeks are more downriver past uh, Swinging Bridge area. So you will have a little bit of a chance for clear water. You'll see us running up to the dam or around Swinging Bridge to try to get get above the mud before it takes over all of it. Um, around Wildflower, there's a creek that really comes in um, there that really muds up above uh, Wildflower that pushes on down in front of Primrose and pushes on down that way. Um, it clears up a little bit above Wildflower, but then again, Canoe or uh, Sulphur Creek will come in there around Fat Possum. Um, so, it just, you know, anything, anything above Swinging Bridge is going to be less muddy when those rains come for the first little bit that first day. Um, and then, of course, when they push any kind of water at all, this spillway water that they're pushing out, it's going to clear up a little bit upriver, uh, of course, first. And then one thing, I, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, kind of pointed this towards wade fishermen, um, but there's a couple things I think we probably should, you know, touch on for people that are in their boats. Uh, so I, I've seen people uh, kind of mess their motors up on the river as the river's starting to rise. And what you actually get before that water hits you is a push. And that push really isn't making the water come up very much, but it's speeding it up quite a bit. And then some people get a sense of the water came up so I can run my boat a lot quicker. And uh, when in fact, you know, that river is still kind of low, but it's a lot faster. So if you have a prop, it's going to make it harder to actually get up some of those shoals. And so just be careful there and be aware that that river is going to speed up first and then rise because that bubble of water that they're pushing out of the dam it's pushing all the water ahead of it quicker. If that makes sense to everybody. That totally makes sense. I've never even thought of that. That's a good indication that the water is going to probably hit you as well. And so once you see a speed increase of that river, you know, you know, you got, you got a little couple minutes to get out before it gets to you. But that's a, that's a good indication of river speed. If it increases and you've been standing still, it looks like it's gotten faster. Uh, it's a good indication. Any other questions here on this slide? All right. Keep going. So one of the questions I asked them the other day was, uh, what are your favorite water conditions? And I'll let them talk a little bit about that because I thought that was kind of an interesting, uh, they had interesting answers. Go ahead, Kim. Well, I like the falling water. Um, I'm, I like it a lot better to just, it's easier to fish when it, when it's rising, it's unless you catch that little bubble, they feed real good right up before the hit where it's pushing all that food up off the ground and just rolling under, you know, the rocks and, and getting those bug, bugs up and it's just a feeding frenzy for a little bit and then it just kind of goes flat and then they move out to the to the sides and on the banks. I like the falling water when they start to regroup a little bit more. So um the 12 off or 12 on is, is, is good. I like a good uh, consistent deal of water instead of this uh, grandiose um, high and drop that we often have here. I'd rather have one consistent unit running all the time, but um, that wouldn't be good for waders. So, um, you know, just falling water is my favorite. Um, I, it wouldn't hurt to have eight to 10 hours of generation, um, you know, each day would, would be good. Um, I do a lot of nymphing. Cody does more streamer, I think a lot of streamer fishing. So he likes that higher water, but I do more nymphing. So I like a more uh, steady, stable, water falling. 
Yeah, I agree with you. And um, like she said, as far as streamers go, um, between one and two units, one unit just consistent is like the kind of like the Goldilocks. Uh, it's just dry. You can really, you can nymph in that water. You can throw streamers in that water. So you can kind of do whatever you want to do um, besides wade. <laughs> but, uh, but as far as being successful on that river, uh, a consistent one unit uh, is actually, you can do really, really good. And like, so if they're still running this water from the plug gates tomorrow and it's been staying consistent, the trout will have been able to get used to it by this point should be some really, really good water for the next couple of days if they get, uh, if they stick with this. Mm -hmm. uh, two units of water, you know, it's tough to fish, but you can make it happen. Um, you know, two units while it's falling, they turn that two units on and then they, they turn it off and you're riding that fall. That can be really, really good because the trout are starting to move around. They were pushed up on the banks and now they're starting to they can feel that ease, that current easing up on them a little bit. And so they'll start moving around a little bit, as well as the banks are starting to fall in a little bit too. So it pushes them out of their spots. And so you can kind of catch them moving around and get their attention, throw a big streamer in there. Um, for one unit, you know, same thing. Uh, they're, they're pushed in a little tighter, but still kind of pushed out to the, to the edges. So, uh, it makes it really, really good. They're a lot more likely to come out and chase it on one unit, as well as uh, being able to get in front of them a little easier, not having to use as heavy of a sink line. Uh, as far as nymphing goes, one unit's awesome. Uh, a lot of oxygen in the water during one unit, a lot of food's getting pushed down, and uh, you got a lot of movements that river versus when they're not running water and it turns into like a steel pond. And so uh, having falling water or any kind of water in the river where it adds that movement to the river just really turns up to fishing. And so- Yeah, it, it keeps, like you said, that oxygen is the key word right there. It keeps them moving and going. When that oxygen's depleted out is when it, you know, that bite is just horrible and that oxygen can get depleted in high and low water, right? Um, uh, I mean, if it I'm, comes in real fast and 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 real hard, it just kind of flushes it out, right? And it kind of kind of just the activity just kind of goes dormant. And then when it's real real low, and the temperature is mainly in the summertime, and then if there's a real bad algae problem, um, you know, it's going to take up a lot of that oxygen level. And then you see that there's just no activity at all. So, you know, when we got this consistent water coming, or at least a um, uh, little bit of water each day, then we've got plenty of oxygen in the water, um, right. which makes the bite great. So when they're not biting very good, and you think like today, I can't help but think, you know, that was... There was no water, and then all of a sudden we got this great water. But um, maybe other people did super great today, but I didn't do so well today for the couple of hours I was out. But the bite was just really, really slow. I got excited and about the water, but that oxygen level, I think, was still. I, I think they'll bite a lot better tomorrow. One thing that's different from the generators generating water up and the floodgates coming up. And, and we actually had a question in the chat that will relate to this question is that water that they're generating through the dam is coming from the bottom of the lake. And so that's mm -hmm. cold, cold water. And that's why our river stays so cold. Uh, but those floodgates, when they release, uh, that temperature is whatever that temperature is on the top end of that lake. And so there could be a good uh, temperature change uh, when they turn those floodgates on and that can really slow those fish down. And so once they get used to it, acclimated to it, yeah, they'll start biting better, but any kind of water is going to push uh, oxygen into the river. So any kind of generation, any kind of floodgates, uh, rain, things like that will increase uh, oxygen and thus make the bite better. So the reason why we didn't see it today is just because that it's like putting fish in a fish tank. You know, you got to keep kind of put them in the bags and let them sit in the fish tank for a while before you let them in the tank because it freaks them out. And I think that's part of it. 
But the question was, does the spillway water release elevate river temp versus generation? Which kind of answers that there. The generation is colder water normally, you know, uh, unless it's just freezing cold outside. And then uh, that spillway water is a lot warmer. And so right now, being as cold as it is in the wintertime, that temperature change isn't a real, real big deal unless it's that day. Um, but really when we're really, when it really hurts is in the dead of summer and that lake is really, really hot. And then they go to open the floodgates and then they warm that river up. That's when we'd be worried about the temperature in front of the floodgates. I'll just say this, Dr. Cody, you made the full transition to a guide. If you teed this up with, you need to be here tomorrow. <laughs> need to be here tomorrow, guys. Going to be great tomorrow. You need to be here tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going this is just a different way of, this is also in that chart, and it's just a different way to look at some of the same data. It's just an interesting way to kind of see the ebbs and flows, um, how the water is dropping out. You can see that it's dropping. You can see that, like, the only reason we kind of pulled this was just to show, like, you can get rain and still have it kind of dropping out a little bit. And so just, it's just a great way to kind of look at it and see kind of how this thing is kind of fluctuating day to day. This is another really interesting one. Um, if you went in there and looked at it right now, I suspect it would look kind of interesting because your energy is going to be flat, but you're going to see the flow is up. It's just another graphic, it's just a visual presentation of some of those numbers. Um, and here you can see that this is in a generation schedule. So, uh, the energy production closely mirrors the flow of the water. Um, but if we went in there right now and looked at it, again, it's going to look real different right now. Um, it's just another way to look at it. So that's kind of that piece. That's the, that's the releases. And now we want to talk a little bit about forecast. So the, so the last was, what are they doing now? What have they been doing recently? This one's really... What's coming down the path? And then what I would point out is that if you haven't used this, you'll go to this forecast and it's done day by day. Um, and Cody, uh, Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, but generally speaking, you're gonna get the schedule for the next day at 4 p.m. the day before. Right. Uh, except on, on, on Fridays, it'll go Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Monday's sometimes accurate. So there you go. So on Friday afternoon, you can figure out what they're doing for the weekend, but the rest of the days, it's um, pretty much the next day. Usually at four o'clock, they'll have it posted. Um, after four o'clock, they'll post the next day's generation. But it's a forecast. It can change. And so right. A projection. Yeah. You have to pay attention. So this is what the forecast schedule looks like, and you can see that it's basically all of the powerhouses within the Southwest Power Administration. Um, Greer's Ferry Dam is in the 15th column, it's GFD. Um, and we'll go down to the bottom of the page here in a second, but you can kind of see that this is a, uh, just a typical uh, generation schedule, um, you know, and in this case, uh, the, you know, they didn't start generating until noon. But that's what you're looking at. And that's what that's telling you. Yeah, those those numbers are in six hour increments. And so that little gap in there will kind of keep your head straight if all those numbers kind of get jumbled for you. You can look at those first four, that's zero, you know, midnight to six, then six to noon, and then so on. And so you can kind of chop it up a little bit. And then uh, I don't know if we mentioned this, but so it shows 48. And so 48 on the little red is one unit, while uh, 88 is typically what the number shows for two units. And uh, so you can see there uh, that it'll be different. So like the one that says 13 here, that's bull shoals. You can see it's 236. Well, the little red won't ever get over 88 really. Uh, they show that the power on the little red can actually go up a little more than that. Uh, but typically see the 110, uh, but they'll typically keep it right at 88 megawatts.
Which using those numbers, 48, 88, one and two units, you go back to when they flip that switch, how many hours, how much, how fast is that water traveling to get where I'm at, where I'm fishing? So, so if we 48 wanna... is going to be slower than the 88, two units. Right. Yeah. If we want to. If we want to break down the schedule here, we can kind of, you know, go over what what the river would actually look like this day with this schedule. And so say you're fishing at the dam, you would have until probably 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, uh, which it says right there at 12 that they're going to run. Sometimes they'll do an hour early and it's 11. Um, but so just be ready for it from 11 to 12, they're gonna turn the one unit on. And so at the dam, <coughs> at the dam, you're gonna have uh, one unit of water. Uh, About 30 pump, 100 CFAs. Which will immediately rise at the dam. If you're fishing at Swinging Bridge that day, you would be able to fish until about three o'clock. Uh, so you would have until however long daylight till three o'clock until that water that one unit pool, I would be expecting it in three hours and so uh, that just kind of shows you if you go further down and you're at mossy uh, you know it's going to be even further and so even if you see the schedule where it shows there's going to be generation people like oh the water's going to be up I can't fish well if you go down and fish say you can wait at Ramsey Access, and at, with this schedule, you'd be able to fish until dark uh, at Ramsey. And so knowing that uh, will help you learn exactly, you know, even though they're generating, I can still go wait here and have waitable water all day. Or say you want to fish Swinging Bridge for a few hours. Well, I guess for this schedule, it doesn't really work. Um, but I was going to say, if they run water for only three or four hours and they turn it off, you can fish the lower river that morning and then go up to the dam that afternoon and after it falls out. And so you can kind of play it that way. But for this schedule, you would have weightable water down river for the whole day. And then as you get up closer to the dam, you know, that'll cut off closer to noon. Now, another thing to think about is for the following day, this generation will still be in the lower river that next day. And so that following morning, if you look at the previous day's schedule, you can kind of tell where the water's going to be at the next day. And so that might help me and Kim out determining where we want to go the next day because I like having water in the river. And so if they're not running water in the mornings, but they're running in the afternoons, I know I can go down river and catch a little bit of that fall, uh, you know, for that half half of the day before it falls all the way out. Do you have anything to add to that, Kim? Nope, that's good. Nice right. All right. Any questions on that? All right. And, that's, and this is kind of what we we're getting at earlier uh, when we were kind of showing the different maps. You can see where bull shoals can just you know, their maximum water is much, much faster, much, much more water um, compared to the to Greer's Ferry. So just, again, just understand the principles are the same, but you really got to understand the numbers that operate under each of the river systems. So Tillman, if um, they're only running one unit and our chart shows, at Kyle shows with two units, it takes an, uh, an hour to an hour and a half. If they're only running one unit, can you safely say, given that, you know, if there's no previous day water volume there, that uh, you've got two to, um, let's say, like three hours before um, you get to the couch holes? No, you'd have an hour and a half. An hour and a half to two. Okay. Yeah, it would be at Swinging Ridge by three hours, three and a half hours, uh, even with one unit. Uh, uh, that window was from one to one and a half hours, and that one and a half is on the very, very far end of that estimate. Uh, so even with one unit of water, that's still going to get to Cal Shows because it's not 
I mean, relatively to the dam, Cal Shoals is pretty close. And so uh, it's not going to take very long. Okay. We go back to that uh, there. I mean, you can see Cal Shoals is what, five and a half miles? And that's um, one unit, 3,500. That was our guess. That water can you move four to six miles an hour. So they're going to take a terrible long time. All right. Does that make sense to everybody? So this is one that I'm gonna, we're going to show you. It's called real time. Um, this may not be the one you go to all the time, but we think it, we're kind of talking about it. We thought it's kind of an interesting one to understand. And so that's what it's going to look like. It's going to show all the different um, gauges. Um, and then the one that you're really looking at is kind of that very top column, which is all the different lakes. And kind of the, the instructive part of this, and you can, when you're in the app, you can click on these, and you can kind of see what's going on on the lakes. Um, and you can kind of see where they are in terms of storage and where they are in the, the flood pool and what's changing, how much precipitate, what's going up, what's going down. It's, but I think the, uh, the interesting piece in it is the, is just, it's one of those things where, you know, I'm not trying to defend the Corps of Engineers. I think, you know, although I think they do a fairly decent job of the mission they've been assigned. That little red dot down at the bottom of the screen is Georgetown. So that's where the white and the little red meet. Every one of those red lines is a body of water that's making its way down to Georgetown through this White River Basin. And so it's just to kind of give you an idea of the totality of the watershed and you know how much water can move through there and why so much water can move through there. So that little red dot, so when it's flooding on the White River where that little red dot is, um, that's why they're not generating at Heber. All that water that's getting into the system coming into there. So just kind of a instructive sort of way to see the region and understand why, how much water can move through here and why some of this is as complicated to tease apart as it is. But it is, it is neat that, you know, you can see all the different lakes. And so like say Millwood Lake here, you know, that's not a trout water at all. You know, that's a crappie and bass lake, but you can see all of that stuff right here under one thing versus like if you wanted to see bull shows, Norfolk and Greer's Ferry, instead of hitting the, the releases button on each one of those, uh, you can go to the, just the real time and get all that data in one spot. Huh. So here's another one, and this is one that I think um, most people don't look at, but I think it's one of the, to me, it's one of the most important data points, and it goes to water quality. And so that's in the app. Um, and really for our conversation today, we're going to be looking at the two that are highlighted, GREDO, which is Greer's Fairy Tale Water, and Pangburn, uh, PAGA4. And, I'll, and we'll look at this. And so Really and truly, this one is as much about dissolved, this is about dissolved oxygen. Um, I'll let Kim talk about it because I know this is a, a topic that uh, means, you know, I know she looks at it really hard every day. Well, no, I look at it uh, every now and again, not every day, and I'm just paying more and more attention to it now. I don't know a whole lot about it, but I do know that it does affect the bite a lot. Um, you know, I think uh, having that dissolved oxygen, uh, not having the oxygen in the water, they're not going to bite as much. So it makes sense. More activity, more oxygen, more activity, more bite. Um, I've just been paying attention to those dissolved oxygen numbers on the app each day and noticing and relating that to the activity when I have a good day and a bad day. And they just seem to correlate quite a bit. Um, now today, it's obviously a lot of good oxygen. So there goes that theory. Um, a lot of good dissolved oxygen in the water today. I, I did pretty shitty 
fishing today. So, <laughs> so that theory's gone out the window there. So I don't know a whole lot or enough about it to really elaborate a lot about it, but I, I have noticed that the bite is very little to none when it's been in that three ppm area or the four area. Um, and, and we've been in that um, uh, three parts per millimeter for weeks. Um, and then now that's changing. So uh, Tillman, you may have more information on that, but that is something that I've noticed. Uh, it relates a lot to, to the bite. And I know in the summertime is more critical, I think, than in the wintertime. In the summertime with the hot uh, temperatures in the lower water, then that dissolved oxygen gets um, depleted out pretty quick. And then you have the algae um, dying off and issues there that will take up a lot of that oxygen. And therefore that's, you know, the bite's gonna be bad off because that's, you know, they're, they're conserving their energy. Um, Cody, do you know more on that subject? Uh, you know, some things that affect dissolved oxygen besides the generation is the amount of, uh, you know, silt and, and uh, you, know, so, you know, solids floating around in, in the water column. And so if it's muddy, uh, if we, so say if it's low, we've had this problem last week. Uh, we got a lot of rain but there's no generation. And so we have a lot of runoff going into the river, uh, but it's filling the river up with silt and, and mud. And so as that mud starts filling in the river, um, that dissolved oxygen really starts to tank. And so one thing here is this dissolved oxygen is only at the dam. And so we gotta be mindful of that. This is only at the dam. And if you look at the one at Painburn, it doesn't have a dissolved oxygen. And so we're not seeing dissolved oxygen content below Sulphur Creek, Collins Creek, Big Creek, and all of those. And so when you're seeing, you see on this little chart here, uh, four is pretty low. You know, it says four is not good for fish populations. Well, the last few days, uh, We've been sitting in the threes, you know, 3.5, 3.6, whatever, and um, not super, super good. And then we got that boost of uh, oxygen from all that floodgate, all that water going down, added a lot of water to them, jumped up to 13. And so if that stays up, you know, after they get uh, acclimated to the temperature change, um, then that bite will start going up. But another thing on this water quality, it shows temperature. And so that's another thing we st really, really start to look at, especially during the summertime, that uh, temperature down there at Dewey and uh, at Painburn, we're really paying attention to that because those trout start to really slow down after it gets to above 60 degrees. And at 70 degrees, we start seeing dead fish in the water. And so those are two things that we'll look at. Uh, in that water column or water quality column and uh, just be mindful of that. Yeah, and you'll I actually see the, the sorry, Go ahead. Uh, it's neat to watch what the water changes in temperature when they do put out floodgates. And so in the summertime, you can really tell a difference uh, in, in the water temp as well as, you know, today, if you're looking at it. And I think, so I, I mean, I think it's a predictor. If you have good DO, good dissolved oxygen, the fish are going to be more active because they can breathe. Uh, you know, it's a little bit, you know, when it's, I guess a good way to put it in these times is when the DO is real low, they're breathing through a mask. Um, you know, it's going to make it harder. And I think um, a sportsman, one of the things to be careful of is when you see that dissolved oxygen uh, low, if you play a fish for a long time, yeah. it's a lot, that fish is in much worse shape than when it comes out of the river. So Cody's right. I mean, if you look on the gauge right now, uh, the dissolved oxygen levels hit 13. Uh, so it's on the upper end of the scale. So those fish, uh, Cody's right. You should be there tomorrow because those fish are going to be froggy tomorrow. 
There's a lot they're of oxygen in the water. water too. They're going to feel good. They're going to want to fight. They're going to be. They're going to be in the game. They're going to be feeding because the food's moving. The oxygen's up. It's going to be good conditions. Um, or it's going to be tomorrow. Would be a day that you could look at all of these things that we've talked about tonight and go. Um, all things equal, tomorrow's got the potential to be a pretty good day if you got a boat. Um, and, you know, it's going to be hard waiting tomorrow, uh, but the river will be fishy tomorrow. You can you can almost bet on it. There's a couple of guides that'll take you mm -hmm. if you don't have a boat. And Cody's right, man. You got to we watched that temperature um, over the summer last year. That was part of the conversation that different groups were having with yeah. little. Um, with Corps of Engineers, and that's when they started kind of doing those uh, pulses of water just to bring the water temperature down a little bit to uh, the Little Red, and that was that was why that was important, because as that temperature goes up, the water holds less dissolved oxygen. That dissolved oxygen is not going to be higher at Penguin than it is at the, uh, at the dam. It just can't. There's not anything kind of churning it up. And you can get some things like rain will increase, you know, a good rain will increase the, you know, the surface action will increase dissolved oxygen, but it also brings in silt and sedimentation, which brings down, brings it down. And so um, anyway, this is just one of those where I think a lot of people don't think about it. And so if you're out there and you're saying, man, the fish aren't biting, why is it? This is a real good diagnos diagnostic tool to kind of figure out Maybe they're lethargic because they just can't breathe. They're not getting enough wind. All right. Oh, oh got it. All right, questions. So uh, the question I have is, um, is the same the case with the dissolved oxygen content that you see uh, at the dam only? other than the pain burn number? Uh, the pain burn number doesn't show dissolved oxygen. It just shows the temperature. Correct. Okay, all right. If the dissolved oxygen level is super low at the dam, it's super low below the dam. I mean, sure. it's not getting- It's like Mars. I mean, you'll get some increase if, you know, obviously the oxygen level, um, will go up because just the turbulence of water running over rocks and through the shoals, that's part of the reason that you see so many fish near the shoals is because it's churning, that, that churn of the water is increasing the oxygen. So they're gonna gravitate there because they can breathe better. So that's, I mean, that, that's frankly one of the reason, you know, there's some food, um, uh, you know, obviously there's food around the shoals and it, it, it's feeding lanes and all of that, but a lot of it has to do, by the way, we see the same thing like smallmouth. If you go to the smallmouth streams, that's why the smallmouth are, you know, con congregated right there at the top of the pools and the bottom of the pools. It's because there's more oxygen there. Those bigger smallmouth. Especially in the bottom of the pools. Yep. And that, it is here. It's yeah, that. you hit water quality in that, and then you'll hit the the one that says highlights for groove sparing after for the next spot where it takes you right there at the bottom. All right, any other questions? We covered a lot. It's like black magic. 